we were just told that there was two patients down in the emergency department who were critically unwell and they would be coming up to the unit. There was a real concern as to how big could this get. Floor four, doors opening. That actually could become all consuming and involve many casualties. We were dealing with the unknown. When we first were aware this was a, a nerve agent, we were expecting them not to survive. We have a total world experience of treating three patients for the effects of Novichok poisoning. I think it's safe to say that we're still learning. Late afternoon on the 4th of March, there are two admissions quite unlike any others in this hospital's history. I was um, the sister in charge of the shift. Um, uh, the evening that um, uh, Yulia and Sergei were admitted, at that point we were led to believe that they had taken an overdose, um, so there was no indication at that point um, of um, obviously um, no mention of nerve agent poisoning. They were needing their support with their breathing and um, support with their cardiovascular system. Very quickly the hospital learned who they were and why that was important. Early the following morning the telephone calls were starting. The first I heard about the incident um, was about six o'clock on the Monday morning. It was a conversation that I really could never have imagined in my, my wildest imaginations having uh, with anyone. Um, and uh, essentially the story of, of a, a known Russian spy having been admitted to hospital. Clearly a real situation, but feeling very, very unreal. We then had a briefing um, as a group of executives um, and that was sort of by 7.30, 8am in the morning just to get an update on what was happening. Um, and then by 10am on that Monday morning it had been declared an external incident and of course we started working with the multi-agencies and, and informally enacting an incident we then go into our normal emergency planning and resilience processes. We set up an incident room, uh, we've got very clear lines of communication. On the Tuesday, Detective Sergeant Bailey was admitted and there were members of the public coming forward experiencing symptoms that worried them and inevitably there were people on the wards asking just what exactly are we dealing with here? I did have concerns because obviously when they first came in there was no indication of the fact that it was a nerve agent and therefore we take our normal um, protection when any patient comes in but would have not at that point taken any extra precautions in terms of protecting ourselves. There was a real concern as to how, how big could this get? Um, have we just gone from having two index patients to having something that actually could become all-consuming and involve many casualties? As they continued treating their patients, the early theory about opioid poisoning was discarded. Instead, the near total absence of a critical enzyme from their bodies pointed to something more shocking. By the Tuesday, through various tests and diagnostics that we were running, that's where it became apparent that we were looking at a cholinesterase inhibition. Um, and therefore, what did we deduce from that? And that was really when the question started to arise as to, was this some kind of nerve agent? Doctors realised that what they were seeing were symptoms typical of organophosphate or nerve agent poisoning. The symptoms would have been a range, but things such as very small pupils, um, profuse sweating, you can get things like diarrhoea, uh, in urinary incontinence. Um, your muscles become profoundly weak, and this is one of the main problems that 
It can affect how you can breathe because your, the muscles to let you breathe are weak. It'll affect your cardiovascular system, your blood pressure, your heart rate, and it can also affect um, your function of your brain. Whilst a, a district general hospital laboratory um, cannot test specifically for a nerve agent, um, we are able to request tests for the effect of the nerve agent so we can measure anticholinesterase levels um, and see whether they have been affected. Um, and uh, it was our, our colleagues in Port and Down that helped us with the testing. When we first were aware this was a, a nerve agent, we were expecting them not to survive. We would try all our therapies, we would ensure the best clinical care, but all the evidence was there that they, that they would not survive. As that first week went on, troops and police appeared in the hospital grounds in full protective gear to recover vehicles. We did have the um, police car that was on our emergency department ramp. There was quite an exercise, a military exercise. The irony of it was we could see that from the intensive care unit coffee room. So our staff were watching that um, unfold. Now that had the potential to um, cause them some concern. With the further diagnosis of the agent as a Novichok one, something so rare that there's almost no clinical experience of it, uncertainties multiplied. You don't know the, the, what I'll term the kinetics of the agent, how long it takes to reach its peak effect, how long it's going to last for when things might start to improve, um, whether there are any metabolites of the drug that might have any uh, longer lasting effects and, and probably more um, you know, the longer term uh, you know, outcomes from these things people would simply have had no experience of. It's clear that from the outset, experts from the nearby Port and Down facility, where there are both civilian and defence research labs, played a central role in advising the Salisbury team. We did take counsel. The expert advice we had uh, outside of the hospital, were, it was very clear that the clinical decisions were ours, but we were being foolish not to take their advice, which we did. And I think that helped. And we were dealing with unknowns. Um, I believe this was certainly in this situation um, the first of its kind. And so we reacted as we could accordingly um, and took each day at a time. After a couple of weeks, there were gradual but distinct signs of progress. The exact timing of that and details of the drugs given remain matters of medical confidentiality. When we began seeing some improvement, it happened um, a lot quicker than it was anticipated. Certainly, when you look at this, um, this groups of nerve agents, the expectation from the textbooks, the journals, would have suggested a much longer uh, period of recovery. I remember the first time I heard from the intensive care consultant on duty that week, that the patients were showing signs of recovery. I, I, I switched from trying to think, which, you know, as, as the medical director of the trust, I will always be thinking in best case and worst case scenarios, what will happen if they die? What will happen if they recover? To suddenly thinking, oh, maybe it's less of A and more of B. And that, that was a real turning point for me. I think we'd all agree that we were exceptionally surprised, pleasantly surprised to see the, the recovery happen and at such a pace when it did begin to happen. That I can't easily explain. The Skripals had been heavily sedated. Nearly three weeks in, it was time to start scaling that back for Yulia. It would take longer for her father to reach the same point. You uh, essentially, in very broad terms, lighten the sedation, see how they respond, and if they respond appropriately, you lighten it some more, and, and eventually you get to the point where they're clearly ready to, to, to manage to breathe on your own. You'll switch the sedation off, allow it to clear, and depending on the 
condition of the patient and the agents that you might have been used to sedate them, they will either wake up very quickly or sometimes much more slowly. It really varies from case to case and person to person. Once the Skripal started to regain consciousness and even begin chatting with the nurses and doctors, there were new dilemmas. How much could they be told about what had happened to them? And at what stage would the police be allowed in to interview them? Towards the end, were you just having normal conversations about the weather and the hospital food and, and yes, all that? Yes, yeah. As I say, there was, you know, obviously we were mindful of, um, uh, you know, our responsibility as professionals in terms of what, you know, we, we would discuss with her in terms of the incident and... Um, uh, the ongoing investigations. Um, but you weren't supposed to go there effectively, is that, well, is that what you're saying? Well, I think we just, you know, we, it wasn't our role to, to have those, con it wasn't our role to have those conversations. I was involved in some of those discussions about the timing um, of what we could tell the patients about what had happened to them um, and the timing of when it would be appropriate for the police to speak to the patients as well. Um, and those are very difficult decisions because on the one hand, you want to provide a reassurance to the patients that they are safe and they are being looked after. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to give them information um, that might um, cause difficulties with subsequent police interviews or uh, uh, further along the lines. I certainly found myself very conscious of how I would have felt had I been in, in a similar situation where you're in a foreign country and uh, particularly as information starts to, to come in, into your possession that um, the, you know, the circumstances by which you've arrived there are, are, are clearly way outside the normal. Anyone who's critically ill who wakes up in a, in a hospital um, with two weeks of their life or three weeks or four weeks of their life missing with no family or friends support. That's a very vulnerable and isolated place to, 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 to find yourself in. When international inspectors arrived in Salisbury to gather evidence of the poisoning, they needed blood samples from Yulia and Sergei Skripal. Once again, the staff decided they had to act on the patient's behalf. These were vulnerable patients. Um, they needed some form of advocate and without uh, a court order um, we could not allow things to happen to them without their consent and so it was a process that we, process that we felt that we had to go through. It was recognised from the trust level down to the uh, clinical level that although it was clearly exceptionally important these were still patients who still needed to have um, protection and we still needed to act as their um, advocates. With Yulia, the road to recovery was so promising that one month after the poisoning, she was discharged. But her father would remain on Radnor Ward for several more weeks. I'm sure he would have wanted to have been discharged earlier if he could have been, but he recognised um, uh, you know, that there were ongoing um, issues that needed to be addressed and um, he you know, he was very dignified and accepted the advice that was given to him from the medical team and, you know, waited until it, you know, because obviously, you know, he knew that, you know, when it was time for discharge that um, he needed to be ready to go. So how far was the recovery of those two patients the result of heroic medicine, using drugs or techniques that have never been tried before but carried risks for the patients? People in the hospital differ on that. The sort of more heroic, untested things were, were clearly key to the recovery of these individuals. Um, exactly how much they contributed to their course, you know, we will probably never ever know, but I would say the vast majority of the improvement and, and the success, if you like, of the clinical outcomes in these things, these individuals were, were attributable to the, 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 the very good, generic, basic, critical care, excellent teamwork by the doctors, fantastic care and dedication by our nurses, um, and I guess supported and supplemented a great deal by some um, 
input from from really really well informed international experts, which very fortunately some of whom happen to be on our doorstep at at, at Port and Down. The, there wasn't any heroic medicine. It, uh, it was a matter of using what we know about the science and we got some very good um, scientific and technical advice. Um, knowing the sort of agents that uh, would be effective in treatment, um, monitoring the patients very closely um, to make sure that they are responding to the treatment. Um, and giving them, as I say, the very best supportive um, intensive care treatment that we could. So after more than two months on Radnor Ward, the day approached for Sergei Skripal's discharge. And with that, of course, would come a whole new set of questions. What would become of him? Where would he go? And also, what would the people here who treated the poison victims make of their experience? What had it taught them? I think that was um, very clear from the beginning. I think you, uh, I think you knew that you were a, a small part of a historical moment, a footnote in history, maybe. You recognised that uh, this was something that was unlikely to ever happen again, um, and was quite remarkable that it happened in the first place uh, within your own patch. For those people who say, "Oh, if this was a nerve agent, they'd be dead," what would your response to that be? Um, well, they're not. You know, the, the proof of the pudding is in, is in the outcome. So, so we are very clear about what we were treating. Um, and I think that, uh, that these wouldn't be the first patients that have recovered from, for example, organophosphorus poisoning or other nerve agents. Is it fair to say that people who've been exposed to that kind of poisoning will be in need of long-term assistance medically? Um, I think the honest answer is that we don't know. Um, we have a total world experience of treating three patients um, for the effects of Novichok poisoning. Um, and uh, I, I think it's safe to say that we're still learning. Yeah, we developed some sort of bond with all of our patients and there was something particular about these two that made that last meeting slightly more poignant. But again, that's much more to do with the, the fact that this was an international incident and, and was so unusual in its wider sense rather than anything specifically clinically. There's a sort of severance, if you like, and some closure that's, that um, leaves you sometimes just feeling like you would say goodbye to anyone who, who's, who's made an impact upon you, I guess.